presented a dramatized play reading of Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett in West Hall on the American University at Beirut. This is a video recording of that play reading, but unfortunately, the first few moments of the picture were lost, although we do have the soundtrack. So we will begin with the soundtrack, even though the picture remains this one at present for the first four minutes. You will hear the audience clapping, and as the curtain rises, we see Estragon in the middle of the stage trying, but without success, to pull off his shoe. Vladimir enters and greets him. Nothing to be done. I'm beginning to come round to that opinion. All my life I tried to put it from me, saying, Vladimir, be reasonable. You haven't yet tried everything. And I resumed the struggle. <coughs> so, there you are again. Am I? I'm glad to see you back. I thought you were gone forever. Me too. We'll have to celebrate this. But now, get up till I embrace you. Uh, not now, not now. <laughs> May one inquire where His Highness spent the night? In a ditch. A ditch? Where? Over there. And they didn't beat you? Beat me? Well, certainly they beat me. The same lot as usual. The same? Uh, I don't know. When I think of it. All these years. But for me, where would you be? You'd be nothing more than a little heap of bones at present minute, no doubt about it. And what of it? It's too much for one man. Bones at the present minute, no doubt of it. And what of it? It's too much for one man. On the other hand, what's the good of losing heart now? That's what I say. We should have thought of it years ago, in the 90s. Oh, stop blathering and help me off with this boot. Hand in hand, from the top of the Eiffel Tower, among the first. We were presentable in those days. Now it's too late. They wouldn't even let us up. What are you doing? I'm taking off my boots. Okay, this was uh, meant to just help you get into the atmosphere. What it is, <clears throat> if you, I think if you raise the volume a little bit, can you hear me back there? Yes. You can hear me, all right. Okay, this was a play reading for a 204 class uh, during the wonderful years of the war here. Between, uh, and so it is something that will be playing behind us. You get a visual notion of the sort of action sometimes that it was a play reading, it wasn't a full play, it was just a, a dramatized play reading. Uh, but you'll see the four characters, uh, Vladimir, who has problems with his uh, uh, urinating, and uh, <coughs> that's uh, Gogo, uh, who has trouble with his shoes, and the play progresses. I hope perhaps you've uh, started to look at it and read it because it's, it looks, it's quite a strange play if you're, unless you're used to a theater of the absurd. What I'm going to try to do in this uh, lecture is put you into the atmosphere of the, this was 1950, see, the intellectual atmosphere at the time, what was happening, 
Uh, basically, in the world of art, and in the world of more than just art, realism had become the reigning way of presenting uh, portraits, plays, everything else. And realism had come to mean, just very quickly now, it's a broad, it's a broad issue, but had come to mean that what all art should be doing is presenting to the audience real things, real meaning things that are socio-economic, political, psychological, things that are really going on in, uh, in human beings at the time. Remember 1950 means they've had World War I, they've had the Great Depression, 1929, they've had the wonderful exercise of World War II, and the climate, of course, influences what type of literature comes up at the time. You've already had in Freud, of course, in this whole course, you've had man, the twilight of a civilization. You had before that Nietzsche, sort of prophesying in a sense that European civilization was headed for a crisis of sorts. And so by this time now, you had theater of the absurd, meaning theater reacting against the whole notion that art should be reduced to documentary, to photographic things, to things that you could better explore in a, different, in a different area than in the area of art, that art should bring forth that which is not obvious, that which is not seen at first, and to see what is its meaning. To art should present to you the artist's vision, sight, of what life is really all about, what's going on in the world around them. So this was claimed to be the true realism, anti-realism, the world of the absurd. In theater, for instance, you had expressionism, Dadaism, sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. You had crap, C-R-A-P, theater of cruelty, theater of revolt, theater of the absurd, and theater of paradox, C-R-A-P, crap. Uh, that was one way of expressing what these people were presenting, that, you know, <laughs> The world has reached a level where one way of looking at the whole situation of mankind at the time, the heights of civilization, scientific revolution, technology, enlightenment, all the wonderful things that had brought such great promise to humanity. That somehow we would have the, human, the perfectibility of the human being, progress, automatic progress in all fields. The realistic uh, tendency tended to be itself a reaction against what had been before it. Theater and all of art for entertainment, to make you feel good. <clears throat> you know, like uh, King Lear was, was uh, uh, Shakespeare's play King Lear, one of the greatest tragedies of all time, was being presented with a different ending, so it could have a happy ending. So theater had become commercialized, uh, losing the impact of a Sophocles or a Shakespeare or whatever, you know, all the great names you might think of, that where, where the, 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 theater, the theater person, the dramatist, was presenting for you, challenging us, continues to challenge us, those great works, to think about your own life right now. That's why we call them classics in CVSP. And so this has become a kind of a classic, waiting for Godot's come, a, a classic of coming back to the, the seriousness of theater, the theater shouldn't just be there to uh, entertain you. And so the realistic movement, the movement of realism and naturalism and things like that, meant sort of along the lines of documentary. But do not just a documentary you know, as, as you film it, but let's show in our play how human beings actually interact with each other in the given social order, how they interact with each other uh, in, in their environment. So environmental determinism had come to be very popular. We're all determined by our socioeconomic political environment or our psychological uh, determinism. <clears throat> we are id, after all. So all of this had come to a head where a reaction against it took place. That fine, we want to talk about this. We want to talk about the real human being in their real situation. But in art and in theater and in music and in, you know, and in novels and all of this, we don't want to just do what we, what we can do with a camera or with a tape recorder or with whatever. We want to go deeper. And so 
Theater of the Absurd is one example of this whole anti-realistic movement where the claim was that we are the true realists because we are really helping you to penetrate beyond the surface into the abyss. You remember Amun Nietzsche and Peter Bornadal's book is called the, the Surface and the Abyss. Well, how do you get into the abyss? Right? Well, this is supposedly the, the genius of, uh, uh, of the world of art. And, and so don't, you know, don't mix up the world, the, the world of science and philosophy and, and prose and theory and all this with the world of art. The world of art, therefore, is being presented now in uh, Theater of the Absurd, obviously the meaning of it, that finally throughout, through this play, you're supposed to be challenged with the possibility that, you know, there is no meaning in life. You know, we always talk about we want to find the meaning in life. We want to forgive, you know, we want to read the, the past to see how they understood meaning of life. And we want to look at all the cultures of the world to see what they, how they believe what is the meaning of life. Well, this challenge was that, you know, maybe the people of the past who had glimpsed this and had put it into certain of their works, maybe that aspect of Shakespeare, that aspect of Oedipus, that aspect of some of the other great classics, of even Gilgamesh and all of this, that there's a kind of element of futility, that whatever we do doesn't really reach anything, so that primarily we're living in a world, a universe that is sourd in French, deaf, absurd, deaf to the real needs of a human being. Now, how do you present this, okay? Camus and, and Sartre presented it in their, in their novels, Sisyphus and you know, various uh, novels that, uh, that, that th those are the famous ones in the 20th century, Sartre and Camus. Okay, but that's the world of a novel, of uh, a philosophical novel, if you like. And of course, in the philosophies of the 20th century, there was much of this element, the element of the absurd in existentialism, and all of the existentialist schools had sort of incorporated within themselves, within their philosophies, the whole notion that, well, maybe life is absurd. You can't just dismiss that. Oh, no, there is meaning. Well, you need to face up to it. Maybe the world finally is really absurd. And what we all do is just, you know, pass time, the passing of time. If you, re if you read Freud's book, or if you read about Freud, what he says about the book that you read in this course is that he wrote it because he was getting too old to do anything else and it, it was a way of his passing time. He didn't like playing cards much. You know, he didn't like playing with his mobile and the IT stuff. He, said, you know, he didn't like to do the sort of things you guys do to just pass time. So to pass time, he wrote Civilization and Its Discontent. Now obviously, you know, it's, it's, a much, it's a much greater work than just that. But this whole mood was prevalent in much of the intellectual circles of the mid-20th century. And so in this play, primarily the purpose of it, if you see it, if you see it done well, all right, if it succeeds in doing what it's, it's meant to do, a full production, it should you know, challenge you with that. Okay, what do you think is meaning? Okay, no, it's that, no, it's that, no, it's this, no, it's that. Well, he's trying to, what he's trying to uh, present to you that, you know, possibly, all these things are just your own wish fulfillments, your own projections, your own you know, comforting yourself, whatever. So in the Freudian tradition, this you know, is, is quite understandable as a play that presents m m many of the same uh, items that Freud was presenting in his own way. So life is full of activity, but there's no real action. And action means that which really produces, in this, sense, in this meaning, something really produces meaning, gives meaning to, to whatever is happening in the play. The play progresses, and then you get, some, you get more light, and you get more meaning, and it's, you know, then by the end you have, a, you have some meaning, so you can summarize it all. And if you're writing a critique of the play the next day, you can write a summary of what this play was all about, in, you know, in, as intellectual terms, or whatever terms you wish. What he's saying is that misses the point. Beckett is telling you that his understanding of the world and those who were with him in the absurdist movement in the mid-20th uh, mid century were all in their own ways, Georges Hadi, writing in French, okay, Ionesco, uh, Beckett, all the people who were writing in this mode for, for, for theater 
were using their plays, whichever one of them you happen to attend, and the basic idea is to put this basic challenge across. Maybe all, this, all these promises, all these gods we have been following for the last few centuries from the time of the you know, of early modernity and the Enlightenment and uh, you know, all this, and the, uh, th that maybe they're all false gods. We've just been thinking they're going to lead us somewhere, and they don't. They've only led us finally to this crappy situation we're all finding ourselves in. World War I, breakdown of capitalism in the, uh, the 1929 uh, crash, the, uh, the uh, World War II. So put yourself, and this is, one, this is the only way really we can really appreciate literature that comes to us, not just from our own immediate day, is you have to try as much as possible, put yourself in the shoes of human beings, like yourself, who are living there. And then you'll appreciate what they present to us. Now, Nietzsche had said, if you've had in this course, all philosophy is an autobiography. If you really want to understand Nietzsche, you've got to put yourself into the context he was in, not your context today. You've got to put yourself in Nietzsche's context. You want to really understand man, you have to put yourself in his, in his context. This is called <laughs> one form of empathy in scholarship. That when you, the more you do that, the more you can get out of it, what was, as much as you can, what was trying to be said by that. And then you do the other thing of evaluate it from your own point of view, compare it to other points of view, etc. That's the critical thinking exercise, you know, the big slogan. We all want, want you to be critical thinkers. Well, in CVSP, as far as I'm concerned, it means primarily because you're dealing with literature that's come from the past, much of it, although now in 204 you're much more contemporaneous. But the same thing for this play. You cannot just start off with deciding, ah, oh, you know, but that's stupid, this is all stupid. You read the play, you see that they talk to each other and there's no meaning. Nobody understands anybody. They talk parallel to each other. So if you just read it in a surface way, and that's what you should do with this text, just read it as a text. But then always remember, this has to be brought to life. This is a play. And until the text is brought to life, it's like a musical score for a deaf person or a, uh, somebody who doesn't have an ear, a good ear just reading the score, you know, uh, how much can he judge of a great work of music? So in this kind of a, a world of a play that is trying to present to you in symbolic form, rather than in documentary prose and description and preaching and whatever else, you know, because everything is preaching, okay, this is what Nietzsche meant, that every philosopher really is, is this autobiography and they're preaching at you through their philosophy one way or another. So basically, to get into this, the world of this play. First of all, just a little bit about Beckett. Samuel Beckett, uh, he, he died in, in uh, well, I forgot now which year, but around 1981. But he was born in 1906 to middle class, Protest put yourself in his place a little bit in other words. He was born to middle class Protestant parents near very, 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 very Catholic Dublin. So already, you know, he's just, just in that kind of an environment, you know, in those days, of course, now nobody fights each other for, product, for religious reasons, you know, we've gone well beyond that. But I mean, in those haram, in those dinosaur days, people used to fight each other uh, uh, on, on religious grounds. So anyway, I, I hope you get the, the cynicism in it, but, but, and no, nobody be offended. But he was, he was living, you know, in a, in a, in not necessarily in the most comfortable uh, environment. He was a very bright student of modern languages at Trinity College, one of the most important you know, uh, play, place in Dublin. Upon graduation, he taught at the prestigious École Normale Supérieure in Paris between 1920 and 1930. He returned to Dublin to hold the position of assistant lecturer in French at Trinity College. Two years later, he left an academic career to travel around Germany and France until in 1937 he decided to settle down permanently in Paris. During World War II, he joined the French Resistance, the Mukhawami, working near Avignon as an agricultural laborer. After the war, he settled back in Paris and decided to write in the French language. Thus, many of his most famous works, including Waiting for Godot, was first created in French, later to be translated by himself into his mother tongue, English. He said that he really thought this was extremely important because he thought when he was writing in his own tongue, he'd kind of sort of be writing somewhat cliche, somewhat something, but in writing in French, he had to really think about 
in another language. He had to really think about the words he was using, uh, although he then later said that he actually wrote this thing in sort of a spurt of genius. Just it all came out in one, one, uh, one long session. Anyway, this is just a bit of a background. Uh, he joined then uh, in 59, Trinity University in 1959. He bestowed upon him an honorary doctorate in letters. And in 1969, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. But please pay attention to this sentence, that the sentence of why they gave him the Nobel Prize. For writing, which acquired its elevation in the destitution of modern man. Great writing, reaching its elevation Writing about what? The destitution of modern man. So this is kind of a, a, a grim picture of where human civilization was headed. Nietzsche sounding the alarm of slave morality, herd morality, conformism, all right? a, a surface understanding of everything. Okay? So you had Thomas Mann and his uh, you know, this death in Venice, so it's like once again the whole theme of, of, of death, and then uh, with, with Freud, of course, that you know, the basically we're just, you know, we're slaves of our id in one, whatever way you look at it. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a magnificent uh, picture of the human being, finally, but if you look at it deep, very deeply, in his own, his own, he was a very pessimistic person himself, finally, that it was not writing about still within the mode of the uh, 17th and 18th and, uh, and part of the 19th century of you know, great optimism and we're all headed for, you know, for perfectibility and heaven on earth and uh, uh, all that sort of stuff with Marx, of course, you know, that basically Marxism uh, claimed that you know, we're not going to bring heaven on earth through any sort of religion or anything like that. We're going to bring heaven on earth. It's not by praying the Our Father for Christians you know, every day, may this earth become heavenly and then Christians do nothing about it. Or, or if they do, I don't know. But the primarily is saying, you know, Marx, Marx takes this cynical view and says, no, if we're going to bring heaven on earth, we have to do it. And so Marxism is most meant to be a way of, uh, of life which would bring, for, would bring heaven on earth. The last of the great enlightenment philosophies, really, of systems. He's written very important novels, poems, short stories, in addition to plays and mimes for stage and radio. He died in 1991, right. <laughs> I was giving the lecture in 1991 when, when uh, I had to also grieve with others who were grieving when, in, on the announcement that he was uh, there. So, uh, basically, this is, you know, whatever, any more biography you can get for these people from the web. You know, instead of playing games on the web and whatever else one does, you can pick up a lot more about them. What I have to do today is simply give you, fit, fit this in within our CVSP scheme. Of what are we trying to do, you know, with the short time, with the brief time we have and so many things that we do. That's why we try to pick up themes that go through from, you know, from, uh, Nietzsche, and Mar from Nietzsche and Marx and Darwin and uh, all the people you've been doing in this particular semester. Now, a play that tries in one, in, uh, to give you one kind of synthesis of what all of that is all about. One of the things that I have on your sheet there, by the way, look at the, towards the bottom, nine, number nine. It's the ethos of the failure of all of the gods. Now, when you say gods, don't just think religion, all right? Humans are humans, and they produce gods in everything they do, right? not just in their religious activities. So uh, b basically, all of the gods, all of the promises we have been ha we've been having have come to absolutely nothing. So what should, what's left? And that's one of the things that's most difficult to get out of this particular play, because he himself denied being a nihilist, or a pessimist, or any, put, put, don't put him into any category. He felt that he was basically presenting this for as a challenge, and each, but each one of us can understand it any way they like. And so, basically, he says uh, at one point uh, that, you know, if you find meaning in this play, and the critics find meaning in this play, and they write all kinds of fancy uh, things about it, well, you know, don't blame me for any headaches you get. You know, give, your, give, give yourself aspirin. Don't come to me for aspirin. Meaning, he thinks that this is kind of a do-it-yourself uh, do play. The meaning of it, you have to look into this play. You have to 
kind of challenge whatever views you have with this particular view of life. And the challenge, of course, is well, what is meaning in life for you? You know, are you just taking it for granted? Have you started at least a little bit to think about it and, and, and challenge your own sort of just inherited beliefs and the beliefs you, you just think are just automatic and you take for granted by osmosis or whatever or by, you know, just wanting to get ahead in the, in the politically correct way in whatever your society happens to be at the time. But are you doing anything to really find meaning? So he thinks, he's, he thought that his work was a, quite a serious work, not at all pessimistic. He thought there was hope in his play. So what's the other side that one is trying to see in this particular play? Well, primarily, it really boils down to the title, Waiting. Now, waiting can seem very passive and innocuous and, a, you know, a, a, a surrender to difficult, difficulties in life and, and all of that. But if, you know, certainly Becker didn't think that was what he was doing. And you can, we can all feel free to find whatever we find in it. Uh, but he thought that in, in, a, in some way, in a paradoxical way perhaps, in, a, in, in, a, you know, in an absurd way, in a revolting way, in a cruel way, whatever, all those, you know, those terms that sort of uh, try to wake you up, that life is not just sweet and happy and pleasant and reason will solve everything and science will solve everything and that you know, life can be crappy. But that's a challenge for you to actually find meaning. Now, what is his, <laughs> what's his answer? Well, his answer is don't give in to any of the gods that are around you. But keep looking. So waiting for him is not just a passive waiting, you know, a cop-out, a loss. No, no, no. Waiting means you have to face all these gods. And you have to re reject them. This is, you know, a very Nietzschean, <laughs> a very Nietzschean. Uh, way of reacting to life, you know, the uh, breaking down, the ha hammering away at all the idols of the, that are there. Everything that comforts you, everything that's a, a, a nice ideology that then lets you sort of say, oh, fine, that's it, all I need to do now to get successful is do this, 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 and this. I now have my prescription for what life is all about, and I have meaning and all this. So wherever you get that from, okay, that's the real cop out. That's the slave. That's the herd. That's the, uh, you know, that, that's the cop out in this flow of thinking that you have from uh, Nietzsche to Beckett. So what is the positive aspect of waiting? So first of all then, waiting means not accepting something just because you want to accept something. I have to have meaning. I've got to know something. So I'll take this one because that seems fine. That seems nice. That seems good. And that seems good. You take whatever, obviously, has convinces you, but you challenge it, you try to refine it, you try to see, does it have life in it? You know, coming back to Nietzsche, you know, connect this to Nietzsche, they're, they're not separate from each other, all these people. Connect it to, what did life, what did Nietzsche say was the, the, the measure of truth? The measure of truth was life. Does it give life, finally? Among other things, of course, but is it giving you life? You know, <laughs> is it giving you joy? Is it giving you freedom? All right? Otherwise, why, why do you want truth? <laughs> If, if, if the truth that's being sold to you is a truth that's going to make you dead and mediocre and, and just accept whatever and be a, a, you know, a sheep or a slave or a herd or whatever, all right, then why accept it? So this doesn't mean don't accept something you find life in. On the contrary, if you're finding real life in there, hold on to it. But don't hold on to it like it's a god. Halas, it's it, that's it. No, no, no. Keep looking for more. Wait. So waiting can be understood, and has been understood, in this much more positive uh, sense, that what he's really trying to tell us through all of this, don't cop out, don't seek the mediocre, don't do this, keep the hope going, there must be something better, wait! All right? There must be something better than what you have now. So that's one way of understanding sort of globally what this particular work is all about. Now let me just fill in a few items there on the fly sheet to sort of tell you how this can be put into something of a systematic form. Although these people hated systems, because systems let, let you think, Halas, that's it, now I know how to live my life. Systems are wonderful in technology and science and medicine, but in your human thinking of what life is all about, when you attach yourself to a system, whatever that system is, you know, it, it can be a Nietzschean system, or it can be a, it can be a religious system, or it can be a, uh, an atheistic system, or a Darwinian system. Don't get into systems. This was the heart of the existential thinking. Existentialism is not irrationalism. Existential meant 
Exactly. Don't accept these rachetta, these prescriptions, these, these ready-made uh, uh, you know, thing, menus. If you, if you follow this system, uh, it'll get you somewhere. Don't follow a Freudian system. Don't follow a Darwinian system. Don't follow a, uh, a feminist system. Don't follow the heart of what these things were meant to be trying to do. What was Freud trying to do? What are feminists trying to do? What are this trying to do? Get the heart. Get the life. Pr bring all the life from wherever you can find it together. Let that be. Let that be your aim. Okay, in life, and, then, and, and so wait. Wait means don't go too fast. Right? So this is one way of understanding why he always insisted that his play <laughs> was giving us hope. Right? And so let's take a look at some of those points on the fly sheet you have there. Under now, number seven. He says, you know, if, if this play gives you a headache when you want to try to give a CS lecture on it or you want to give a criticism, then go get your own aspirin. <laughs> in other words, so I have to give a lecture on it. And this is, you know, my way of having understood this in the context of two great movements, the anti-realism. So in anti-realism, he's, he's provoking us our creative aspects to come forth our symbolic aspects, our ability to see things in symbol, not just in words and, and prose and all this, but to see things in intuition, in sight. Okay? You see truths that are human. You know, you're using your, your other aspects of your mind, but you, until you see a truth, and meaning see it means you're testing it in your life, and now your life and your mind come together with what you accept as truth. This is existential thinking. Right? It can lead you into atheism, it can lead you into belief, it can believe, lead you anywhere, as long as you're taking your own authentic path. That's the way of existentialism. So existentialism is different from the absurd in that it tells you you must face the challenge of the absurd, but then you must see how you can bring meaning out of it. You are the bringer of meaning out of it. You don't just accept meaning from the outside. You, the human, receive, but then what you do with it is you give meaning. And so with atheism, of course, like Jean-Paul Sartre, all right, you are creating your own nature. We don't, we're not born with a nature. You're creating your own nature with every action you take, every decision you take, all right? And the only way to live a, 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 a decent life is to be authentic, meaning don't be hypocritical, don't fool yourself, always be open to correction, always be open to wait and move and go on with all of this. But in, in theistic existentialism, they believe that Christianity is, was, was not meant to ever reach what it has reached in the passive cultures that Nietzsche was attacking and, other, and Kierkegaard before him and others after him, but that Christianity was all about life and joy and freedom and hope. And if you don't see that in your Christianity, why are you going on being a Christian? <laughs> you know, they're, they're just because you want to go to heaven, you don't want to go to hell, you're already in either a heaven or a hell, believe it or not. So the, the, the existential thinkers in the 20th century took this absurd challenge. There's no given meaning from a system, from a great philosopher, from, you know, religion as understood as creed or some sort of, you know, uh, uh, pharisaic law or something like that, that finally life is the, life, joy, and freedom are the measures of truth. And, don't, and as a human, it's not, easy, it's, it's not easy to put it into a philosophy and that's simple, but it's a challenge for the human uh, that you've been getting up to now in 204 and now you're getting it here. Wait, but wait in that kind of a sense. So now if you take a look at the sheets, number one, he calls it a direct presentation of life. What you see in this play, if you, you're with it, you see a direct presentation of life. It's not talking about life. It's not giving you a, a, a very sophisticated French novel a la Camus or, or Sartre, but it's giving you a direct experience. So if you take a look at this to help you understand what that might mean, this is one of the great uh, classics of the 20th century in the world of art, Picasso's Guernica, all right? He presented this at the time of the Spanish Civil War, when Spaniards were tearing each other apart and uh, other countries were joining in the fun and there was the Civil War and, and all of this. Okay, this is just because I don't have time to tell you all the details, but you look, look into the, the details of what was happening at the time in Picasso, uh, Guernica. But this is an example of a piece of art that presents you with a direct experience of life. 
All right? It's not telling you about life, but supposedly that's what art is supposed to do for you. If you take art from the time of kindergarten and grammar school and all of this, you develop, your artistic capacities are developed, and you can start to appreciate art and the symbolism of art and what art does for you, supposedly it's, it reach, it's supposed to uh, reach a point where uh, a work like this can give life, can give uh, a challenge, can, can not just be, okay, let's look at it and see, well, there's this point there and there's this point. point. It's kind of like, you know, you... La samahallah, but if somebody comes in and decides they want to get rid of me so they have a, you know, they're going to commit suicide here, but of course they take you with them, all right? You know, what, what would this hall kind of look like? So, I mean, in, in, that might be one way of looking at this. All right? The Civil War has produced this kind of fragmentation, this kind of all of that. So, it's a, you know, one shouldn't have to, in, in other words, if you know the context, you know what it's doing, okay? You, take it, you know what art's all about, you're not deadened by the, th the theories of realism and naturalism in art, all right? Through this kind of appreciation of art, you can see things in depth. Right, beyond the surface. The surface you can get through your academic work, you can get the surface through reading you know, uh, uh, theories and things like that, but you'll never reach the heart of your life. You'll always stay on the surface, you'll never reach the abyss. Okay? That this, is, this, this is a theme that comes from Augustine into Pascal into Nietzsche into all that. that li the truth of life is not the creed of religion, it's not the laws of religion, it's the heart, the will, all right? So, when the, the, it's, 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 you know, reason is wonderful, but reason only gives you light. It's the will that brings forth life and brings forth joy and brings through uh, uh, freedom and also brings forth all the horrible things humans do. So until you reach the heart of the human being, the will of the human being, you won't understand the human being. And so all of art, serious art, in one way or another, is trying to get you below the surface into your own will, your own decisions, your own actions, you know, your own creating of your own nature, all right? For the Christian, of course, it's collaborating with the nature God gives you, because if you don't collaborate with the, with the nature God gives you, you're a, you know, you're a, you're a Nietzschean slave or a herd, or a, you just want a passport to heaven, you know, pie in the sky, by and by. But if you understand the depths of what, your, what, what uh, any serious religion or any serious thing is trying to tell you is, go down below the surface, see what life is really all about in the place you are. And then if you're a Christian, pray that, and, and, believe, and do work for it. Bring heaven down here to earth. Don't be living for heaven. <laughs> right? If you don't bring heaven down here, you don't understand anything of what that particular uh, religion is meant to be all about. And this is what Nietzsche, of course, was reacting against. He says this, and that the people were calling themselves Christian, and there's a Christian society and Christian civilization, and, and the heart was was somewhere else. There was no will. There was no uh, serious will. The will was all just for, you know, slave and morality and, uh, and all this sort of stuff. So, looking now at the, from the picture, for this is what, what he thinks, this work is like that. You know, if you, if you really pay attention, if you see it more than once, if you see it well done, it will supposedly communicate to you a view of your own life and challenge you. That, well, what, what are all the things you think are giving meaning to your life. What, do you th what are you doing today that you think is really going to be something very, very important? Well, measure them. Check them, all right? Go back to Socrates. You think you know, but you, you're only intelligent. You only know if you know you don't know. In other words, keep going. Don't stop in the search for uh, any truth, but certainly the truth of your own humanity. So, a direct presentation. Plato's cave. If you did anything into it in CVSP before now, that's a kind, that was a sort of impact that it was meant to have on you. Plato's cave story, Dante's uh, purgatory, hell, heaven, the, as symbols of, of life. You know, life can be hellish, it can be heavenly, it can be purgatorial. If you don't understand that, you just look at it in terms of doctrine or something like that. You miss the whole human point in great literature of cultures. You don't accept their belief systems, but their great art, their great literature might perhaps uh, uh, be interesting. In one sense, and this is very important, number three there, we at, especially at universities, we are all dragged into intellectual reductionism of the complex crete, concreteness of life. All right? We're all, we have to do what we do at the academic world, it's very wonderful, but we need to see its limit. Its limit, it does not reach the, we cannot, it's not made for that, the university. <laughs> it's meant to prepare you to go off and reach the, uh, the comp understand better 
the complex concreteness of life. You can't abstractize life into, for, we, 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 we put in isms and abstractions to guide us, to help us. But not as if they're halas, that's it. You know, if, you, if you've got that, you've got everything. So that's what all this reaction of this time and throughout the 20th century, its primary heart was this. Intellectual reductionism, the enlightenment, the reason as understood by the enlightenment, math and, uh, and data, you know, a, a computer, you know, all the whole movements of romanticism had already come up to sort of warn what was happening. Nietzsche in, to, in philosophy tries to put it into his, the way he put it. Okay, we're going towards a, a reductionism of life. Reductionism is always bad when you're doing scholarship and of anything, you need to know you're doing it. Reducing something by taking one part of it and pretending that part is everything and you, you might be losing the most important parts of it. We have to do that at a university, we have it by nature, but in life don't ever let that happen. And so therefore we come to now B there, under seven, B. This is now the other great movement in the early part of the 20th century. Around a man named Heidegger, there were other, he, you know, the others who disagreed with certain things he was doing, but Heidegger was, the, was, was a very powerful philosophical influence in the 20th century. And he had presented the, 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 the notion, the image of the human being as thrown into the world. Who am I as a human being? Well, when I wake up, in other words, and I start to think and reflect and look and see what is the meaning of life and, and all the critical thinking, all right? Well, I should, I should start on something that's, you know, I need a firm ground to start on. All right, Descartes had said, I think, therefore I am, and so he thought he could deduce everything from there. Well, now this is much more of a uh, sort of an existential st uh, certain starting point, and that is that I don't know anything about what life is all about. I don't know really where I come from in the origins. I don't know really where I'm headed. You know, the Socratic thing of Socrates is the wisest man because he's the only one he knows he does not know. So in that capacity, it isn't so don't take it literally if I know nothing. But the challenge of going forward. So therefore, start off with yourself just as, okay, you've been thrown into the world. Okay, now if the climate of Beckett is, of course, there's no God to give me meaning. There's no society to give me meaning. See, with communism and socialism and all of this, you could have, you know, the, uh, from the past, the, the, the polis of the Greeks and, uh, the, you know, the church and, and, and the ummah and all this, you know, society is, gives us our meaning. God gives us our meaning. Society gives us our meaning. Humanistic values, fraternity, liberty, equality, whatever, you know, the, the slogans of the world that continue up to today. Critical thinking, you know, the, uh, these wonderful humanistic slogans and values have not succeeded in giving us what they have promised. We, haven't, we aren't moving towards a heaven on earth. We've been plunged deeper into hell, if anything else, at this, at this stage, in 1950, with all those wars and everything. So the context always impacts what's being said. But what's being said by somebody serious can always be applied in some way to another situation. So if there's no God and society, remember, for Freud, Society is your worst enemy. Uh, Sartre has said, hell, hell is other people. Because in the Sartrean thing is, you, know, you limit my freedom. You know, I can't just do what I want. And the same thing with Freud, of course, but in different, uh, you know, uh, process differently. So, rather than in the beginning God, which is the heart of all monotheism, since says God, you, you, know, you, you, you know that everything is okay. You, you know, you're, it's not going to be an easy life and all that, but in the beginning, you know, the basic thing that exists, the I am, Yahweh, I am, all right, true existence is God. Okay, now if you don't believe in this God, all right, and you have to sort of seek things otherwise, society is your enemy, and human, because nobody understands anybody, so as the play proceeds, nobody understands anybody. They talk, they talk in all sorts of ways, but they talk parallel to one another. There's no communication. The language expresses the meaning here in this play, that the impotence of communication, the, lo the loss of communication, okay? Wasail al-infisal al the mobile, somebody sent me a WhatsApp with everybody, daddy, mommy, child, that, and dog, each having their IT, you know, and the, that's how they get together, you know. So, so these things are not tisal, they are infisal, they are stopping you. So now, in other words, life is like that, not just because now there are these things that 
get in the way of people actually speaking to each other and seeing each other, but he thinks that that's what life is like. You don't ever expect anybody to really understand you. You have to live, and you have to try, and you see what you can can, but there's no, no, nothing to say, well, there, the meaning is, you know, society, my, my, my link with my wife, with my children, with my friends, with my comrades, with my, uh, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the revolution or whatever. Finally, each one is alone. So aloneness becomes the starting point. I'm alone. Nobody understands me. The universe doesn't understand me. Absurd. It's absurd. There's no good God or wonderful God or forgiving God or whatever you picture you have of God. Society is simply limiting me, repressing me, holding me back from my full freedom. Humanistic values, they're just slogans. And then people always abuse them and they come in, they, they, they you know, the, the, the new Middle East and all the slogans we've been having here, that, you know, the past that we've been hearing ad absurdum in, uh, in the Middle East. You know, the, these are just slogans uh, that will get us nowhere. Democracy, you know, yeah. Uh, democracy, uh, in the beginning, therefore solitude, the inescapable aloneness, alienation. We are fundamentally alienated from our truth, from our source, from, who, from our identity. Uh, there's no fellowship, there's no empathy, there's no communication, and that's expressed in the impotence of language. They never understand each other, they just talk. The essence of life is anguish. As soon as you start thinking anguish, and why anguish? Because you're gonna die. And when you see what you're going to die, oh, you're going to say, oh yeah, well, everybody dies. Fine, you're a Gilgamesh before he wakes up. And if you, if you ever read Gilgamesh, right? you're, you know, you're still a herd, you're still a slave, you're still a passive human creature. When, until the force of death hits you personally, all right, then you're not dealing with death. You're dealing with some abstraction. Death is a reality. That's the existential philosophy. Existential philosophy deals with realities. All right? And use your reason, your reason, but on realities, not on abstractions. So death is a, is a reality. And when you really face it properly, it can only cause you anguish because there's no meaning for it. You see, if you, if you think there is meaning, fine. You remember, we're, not, we're only talking about this, this view of life. Don't let me depress you. <laughs> and I'm not preaching it. I'm trying to teach it, to make it clear. All right. If you don't believe there is anything giving meaning, and you're going to die, and therefore there's no meaning to this mortality, you think Gilgamesh, and you know, maybe you may not have had him, but that's not my problem. All right. But you know, why should I accept death? I'm going to really try to find some answer. I'm going to go and do whatever is needed. You know, I'm, going to, I'm not just going to uh, do that, but it's, it's meaningless. The meaninglessness is what hurts. So why is that important? Because that's, that's the, at the heart of theater of the absurd and the philosophy of the absurd. Life may be meaningless. Maybe you're looking for it, you're never going to find it, but that's too much of a conclusion. Therefore, wait. You never know. Maybe tomorrow something will happen. You know, maybe next year something will happen. Wait, don't give up. Don't commit suicide. That's stupid because you don't have enough information to tell you you should commit suicide. But you don't have em enough information to say, I have hope, serious hope. Hope means something on, on basis, based on reality, on existence, on experience, all right? I don't have that kind of certainty either positively or negatively. So therefore, what's the most intelligent thing to do from that? Wait. Right? But wait in the way I tried to explain waiting at the beginning. Wait actively, wait positively. Don't give in, don't, don't accept a false god to follow. Uh, this is the... So, life is anguish, there is no meaning. Monotony does not mean boredom. You're bored with this lecture, I, can, you know, I understand that. But if you watch a play of Waiting for Godot and you get bored, that's a, a lousy play. You know, you got to grab the director and the actors and tell them they better do something about it because there's a great fun in this play. He calls it a tragic comedy. Meaning, don't look for definitions of these things. Try to understand what's being done through, directly through the play. Play, the, the life is not neither tragic nor comic because that would give you some clear meaning. All right? It has serious elements of both. All right? And therefore, what does that do to you? It tells you the only serious conclusion you should do is wait. It may be, com comic means hopeful. Tragic means do your best, be heroic, serve the, uh, humanity, make a name for yourself, but don't ever expect you're gonna get anything better than what happened to an Oedipus who had to kill his daddy and marry his mummy. That's, you know, symbolically the fate of all humans, but Oedipus was very active and, and he did great things for the, for the society and he gave a name to himself by what he did. So the tragic view is a very heroic view. The Nietzsche is in that kind of line of thinking, the tragic thinking. But comic means, no, things, you know, there is hope. 
It's going to be difficult, challenging, suffering, all that, but, but finally we're going to get something out of it. The revolution, you know, we're going to bring something in and, and all of that. It's neither. Neither one is clear. All right? So you get something from here, something from here. Go with it. Keep whatever life you're getting from it. But life, therefore, life itself is a tragic comedy. Don't look for definitions. Right? So think of the meanings in a human's life that he's trying to tell you. So monotony does not mean boredom. It means that finally you have no way of really saying a pig is worse than a CS teacher. If you like bacon and ham, and you, don't, you happen not to like CS teachers, you know, uh, pigs are better than, uh, they, they used this for a pig and Socrates in the past, you know. Well, you know, why, say, why say Socrates any better than a pig? You know, <laughs> that's just a, that's a value judgment. You know, that's not something that's objective or anything like that. So nothing is value, there's no value that's really certain. There's no hierarchy, there's nothing better or, wor or worse. Everything is at the same level value-wise. So when you read through the play, urinating, uh, uh, speculating, uh, dancing, uh, uh, trying to help another person, all the things humans go through, physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual, intellectual, they're all in there in symbol. All of it leads to nothing. So two act play, three acts, you'd lose the meaning. Only two acts in this two act play to give you the meaning that the play goes on, you know, there's action, activity, 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 but it leads nowhere. At the end, a boy comes in, a messenger from supposedly Godot. Godot's not coming today, but he surely will come tomorrow. So you have act two, because if you had only act one, you think, oh, well, he's coming tomorrow. Act two goes through the same sort of thing, basically, and the end of it is a boy who comes in and says, Godot, sorry, he's not coming today, but surely he will come tomorrow. We have, you know, in the Russian we say, Bukra uh, bil mishmish, have you ever heard that expression? Okay, no, yeah, it's tomorrow, Bukra, yeah, no, <laughs> it'll come, but it, it means you don't really expect it. You know. uh, so, it, it challenges you, it tells you basically, don't go for any f things that's certain that you're not, just isn't really giving you life or joy or freedom in the Nietzschean perspective, and, but uh, wait, so monotony, the threat of nothingness, at any moment you could suddenly stop existing, right? That's, you know, that, that, if, if, there's, if there's no meaning to death for you, think about how horrible these truths are challenging you to find meaning that's really serious, that you can really uh, find hope and, and, and freedom from, not just to accept something that's not doing that. And the absurd, therefore, is a way of putting together much of this atmosphere, much of this type of thinking, into a philosophy of, the, of life called the philosophy of the absurd. The human response here is waiting, and is unlike other things that are more active, because many of, the, many of the, uh, the, the, the people who wrote these plays, they didn't stay there. They then went back into social action, back into their Christianity, back into all sorts of fields. They didn't stop there, but it's kind of a, a challenge whatever is your view, is don't stop there, keep going, and finally, one last image. It's kind of like the image of a donkey. I love donkeys, my best friends are donkeys, I'm a donkey. But you know, a donkey, you put a stick in front of him with a carrot, and the donkey will run after the carrot, right? And keep running after the carrot. The carrot is meaning in life, yeah. Running after the carrot, you know. But maybe, you know, you might think, ah, he's never gonna get it, you know. That's a wrong decision. Who knows? Maybe he'll bump it into something, you know? So, we are like donkeys, and there's a carrot on a stick in front of us, telling us, seek meaning, right? And we're seeking the meaning, and it's not easy, you know, we're not gonna find it, don't stop too soon, but who knows? You know, maybe if you go on doing that, maybe something will happen, waiting for Godot. So Godot is whatever it is that really still gives you enough hope to continue living because you shouldn't cop out and commit suicide. Your Godot is whatever it is today that you think is the most important thing you should be seeking to give meaning in life, okay? Seek it, but don't think that's it, there's nothing else. There might be more. Thank you. I shouldn't have started so late. I would have been ill. I shouldn't have started late. I should have... I should have done it now, but I've been thinking play it before and then stop the sound. Because I, I like to read the... Uh, the play?